Hi, it's Kernetex here, and this time I'm going to be building gaming Linux from scratch on a pure 32 bit system. So, the idea for this come around because throughout the gaming Linux from scratch book, there's the occasional mention of what to do if you want to build just 32 bit binaries um, as opposed to building GLFS on. A multi-lib system and I wondered if it would actually be possible using the instructions to do that to actually build GLFS just purely for 32-bit so that's what I'll be recording in these videos uh, for this series now if you consider um, the implications of this you could build it on a 64-bit system and have a 32-bit operating system but uh, in the back of my mind, I thought there's a very remote chance that somehow uh, there could be the possibility that 64-bit binaries would be compiled, even though you'd only have a 32-bit toolchain. Um, it probably wouldn't work like that, but I thought to remove any doubt whatsoever, I'd build it on a CPU that is only capable of 32-bit. Now, the problem there is that the last 32-bit CPUs for the desktop were released um, over 20 years ago and in my research I found that the last um, range of Intel CPUs that supported 32-bit were the Northwood C range so it's a Pentium 4 Northwood C technology um, and as I say that's the last range where all of the range had 32-bit capability only the next release which was uh, the Prescott core had mixed 32-bit and 64-bit CPUs so I discounted that um, you could almost tell it was a 64-bit platform because the socket was LGA775 whereas the Pentium 4s uh, Northwood C and earlier were on the um, 478 pin and 479 I think for the mobile chips um, so that that's a good indication of the move from 32-bit to 64-bit as well um, so I've managed to get hold of a um, Pentium 4 with Northwood C technology um, so it's the last, as I say, generation that completely saw, uh, supported 32-bit across the whole range. Unfortunately, it was only able to get hold of one of the slower end um, within that range. So it's 2.6 gigahertz. The slowest one was a 2.4, and I think the fastest was, I think it was initially a 3 gigahertz, and then it went up to 3.4 um, later on um, towards the end of the life of that range the previous generation the northwood b um, there was only one um, cpu that had another feature about the northwood c generation which was hyper threading so the northwood b um, the top of the range model the 3.06 gigahertz model had hyper threading and that was a new feature on pentium 4s at that time and again, it wasn't until the Northwood C that that feature of hyperthreading was made available across all models within the range. So the Northwood C Pentium 4 is quite unique in that it's the last full range of 32-bit processors, but it also heralded the first complete range of processors that had hyperthreading. And of course, hyperthreading was used um, throughout the the various generations um, of Intel chips apart, apart from a few exceptions um, such as I think the initial core processors didn't have hyper threading to I think it was to help reduce power requirements or heat requirements um, or the heat output rather 
Um, so as I say, it's quite a unique range in, in that respect to have 32-bit with hyper-threading. Um, there's only a limited number of CPUs that had that, um, whether it be the Northwood B, range, uh, Northwood B, Northwood C, or, or the early uh, Prescott architecture chips um, to, to get a pure 32-bit CPU with hyper-threading. So that's the CPU I'll be using. So that that does also mean that it's technology from about 22 years ago um, and yeah in fact um, just looking at some notes I've made here the uh, Northwood C was actually released or, or this particular one I was, I'm going to be using I think the original Northwood C the uh, 3 gigahertz one I think it was the first one that was released was released on the 11th or 12th of April, so it's nigh on um, 22 years ago, 20, 20, uh, 11th of or 12th of April 2003 uh, it was, um, and the one I'm using was released on the 21st of May, so as I say they're both around their sort of 22 year mark, um, to give you an idea of the age of these uh, CPUs. And I guess the reason why I'm telling you all this is because it, it means, as you might expect, that it's going to be quite a long build. They're, they're not the fastest processors to compile code from recent times. Um, not only have com compilers got more complicated, software's got much more complicated as well. There's more to compile, uh, more analysis for the compilers to do. So it does take a lot, lot longer, despite the fact that it, it was, you know, the almost the cream of the crop in its day, uh, the Pentium 4. Another aspect about the Pentium 4 that's fairly unique is that if you look at the equivalent um, in the AMD camp, which would have been the Athlon uh, XP and the Athlon MPs, there's um, something quite distinctive that's still required by today's GUI software, and that's the inclusion of SSE2 instructions. So the Athlon XPs only have MMX and SSE uh, type instructions for accelerating various various things about the code. Um, I think they call the SIMD instructions, uh, streaming data instructions, I think it is. Um, and like I say, the AMDs don't have that, so it does mean I think it's it's either LLVM or Rust requires SSE2 to be available, um, and so obviously it means that you can't compile or get a GUI going it easily. It might be possible, but you can't easily get a GUI going on an Athlon. So there's another um, lucky thing about these Pentium 4s that they do have SSE2 in them. So they're a bit more advanced than the equivalent AMD XPs and MPs at the time, despite the fact that the Athlons were outperforming Pentiums for a while when they were introduced. Um, and it wasn't until I think the Athlon 64s came out um, around about a similar time to this chip, around about 2003, 2004, that they incorporated SS, SSE2. But of course, that's not much use in this situation because I need a a 32-bit CPU with SSE2 capability, and that obviously discounts both the Athlon XP because it hasn't got SSE2, and it discounts the Athlon 64 because it's a 64-bit CPU. So the Pentium 4 Northwood C quite nicely slots into this category. As I say, if you've got a Northwood B, top of the range model, 3.06, that would be sufficient. And also some of the um, early, I think they're the lower range of the next generation, the Prescott's, the LGA775 socket um, chips, some of those early models, the lower end of the range were 32-bit only. Um, otherwise, you'd have to sort of go through on a 64-bit or, or even a, um, well, in fact, you couldn't do a slower CPU uh, or an earlier CPU because it wouldn't have SSE2. So it is quite a limiting thing to do this. Um, and I feel quite lucky that I've managed to get a, 
uh, a chip that fits in with all these requirements to be able to achieve this. So, as so it's going to take a long time. Um, it also means because of that reason, I'm not going to be doing doing any of the tests. Um, I kind of know what to expect from doing the GLFS on the multi-lib Linux from scratch. So if there are any differences, it's going to be because of the 32-bit, 64-bit difference. And obviously, if there's anything obvious that doesn't look right, um, I'm hoping that that will uh, be something that I might, my eye will be keen to, to, to actually identify anything like that. So... Um, with this machine, I've got a version of Linux from scratch 12.3 on it. So it's as it was compiled, as you've seen on my videos uh, of me compiling Linux from scratch 12.3. Um, the only difference bit being that it's on a 32-bit machine. Uh, this machine's also got two gigabytes of RAM on it. So it's plenty for the two hyper threads it's got. There's plenty of RAM for anything that needs um, to, to use that sort of memory. Um, although they generally recommend uh, two gigabytes per core, I've, I've not actually noticed that usage requirement in compiling either MLFS or GLFS. Uh, we're keeping, keeping quite a close eye on that. Um, and certainly compiling um, GCC or any of the other larger packages like LLVM I've, I've not seen the swap file being used in such a way that indicates that the machine has uh, run out of memory. Uh, so two gigabytes is, is plenty. Whether the fact that it's 32 makes uh, 32 bit makes a difference or not, certainly in, in this case it didn't. And certainly the fact that the previous builds were 64 bit without any notice that the uh, or or any observation that the memory wasn't sufficient or that you know, it was using two gig per per core. Um, it, it didn't seem to be that case. So yeah, so I've got this Linux from scratch 12.3. Apart from the standard 12.3, I've also installed tools to gain access, remote access, the usual tools for like um, OpenSSH and WGET I've installed. Um, I may even have done GPM and links, the usual things I like to put on as extras just to allow you to get access to download files um, and also a basic browser just so you can actually do something at the actual console or optionally to do stuff remotely, which is what I'll be doing. I'll be building all of this remotely as I usually do. It's just so much more convenient. It's more convenient to um, record the desktop like that, showing everything that's being done. So... Despite that, I'm going to go through the GLFS and it, it rebuilds a lot of these packages anyway. So I will be rebuilding them. I'll be overwriting what's on there just so that I know I've built GLFS as it says in the book rather than me building those packages either as I've followed them in um, BLFS or I might have tweaked them myself, changed some options or something. And obviously you'll see me doing that, so you'll see the standard build going in um, and overwrite previously what's there. Um, so yeah, basically, effectively, apart from that, it's a standard um, LFS 12.3 build, apart from those few extra packages I've put on, um, everything else is standard. The other thing, as I did with the GLFS on the MLFS videos, is I've already copied all the um, packages needed to build just to save having to download everything while I'm recording. You know, some downloads might be um, might take some time, and also my internet can be a bit flaky. Another thing I've also done is I've pre-compiled the, comp the kernel with all the uh, settings that are required by GLFS again to save time um, especially as last night I compiled the kernel ready for this um, and it took two and a half hours so that would be totally prohibitive to have to rebuild the kernel several times when it's taking that sort of time it would you know be a whole day's worth of recording to um, to get that done to recompile each time so it, it just doesn't make sense to keep recompiling so, as I say, all those options are already pre-built. I will be checking them, though, 
Um, I've already got the. I managed to remember to check the option to keep the config data inside the kernel. So basically, the meta metadata about the kernel is built within the kernel. So I'll integrate interrogate that just so I know that the actual running kernel is is capable, rather than looking at a config file that might be a little bit out of date, possibly. 